This conference will now be recorded. There you go. What is the subject on, Jerry? Uh, is it on uh, the Civil War? We got going with the wind here. No, oh, George is doing <laughs> a series on movies and books of the last 200 years. Oh, that's All right. great. So, so, okay, I'm going to mute, mute everybody's mic, and if you want to talk, you'll have to unmute it. God damn it. Okay, that's you, George. You're, don't forget you're being recorded. Yes, I know. All right, what I wanted to do tonight was talk about <clears throat> the reality of military history as we perceived it when we were going through the various stages of life that we've been through. And I thought it would be interesting to to tell you about some of the books and movies that I think have colored our perspective over of military history over the last 75 or 80 years. Where do you think we get our perspectives and values about history of the military art? And by the way, the history of the military art was the name of the program or the course that Fred and I were taught at the military academy. I think they still teach it, don't they, Fred? Most of them come from the books that we've read, the magazines that we've read, and the movies that we've seen, and to a much lesser degree, I think, from the television we've watched. Most of them came in terms of perspectives and values from our formative years. At that time, the country was growing and our horizons seemed limitless. Perhaps a few came from listening to veterans of that war less from the Korean War, and then came our war, where some of us got to live them. This program is going to be a collage of books and movies that were, to me, the best examples of stories from our American experience. Interestingly, very few of them glorify war. Most portray it very grimly. That then begs the question, why are we so enamored with the subject? Feel free to add a book or movie that you think belongs in this pantheon as we go through it. The first one I wanted to talk about was War and Peace. I read War and Peace when I was in college. It was written by Leo Tolstoy in 1869. He was 30 when he wrote it. His father was a veteran of that war. It tells the story of the French invasion of Russia and the impact of the Napoleonic era on Tsarist society. It is a very long and a very compelling book. I think it was 900 pages long, and I had no trouble reading it. I think I might today. Where Tolstoy got his information <clears throat> was he read letters, journals, autobiographies, biographies of Napoleon. There are 160 real people named or referred to in the book. He is regarded as one of the greatest writers of all time. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize every year from 1902 to 1906, but he was never awarded the prize. Now, Hitler might have benefited from reading it because. Napoleon captured Moscow, and all the Russians did was just retreat. And had Hitler captured Moscow, I have no doubt that they would have done the same thing. Multiple movies have been made of War and Peace. The best one was made in 1956 with Henry Fonda. Some of you might remember that. The next book I wanted to talk about was Gone with the Wind. I suspect. All of you know about Gone with the Wind. I'm not sure how many have read it. It's just a simple story. It's about a manipulative woman and a roguish man. They have a romance during the Civil War and Reconstruction. It was a bodice ripper before the term was popular. It was written by Margaret Mitchell. Uh, she was a journalist in Atlanta. 
She started writing it in 1925 and she wrote the ending first. It was published in 1936 and awarded the Pulitzer Prize the following year. It sold 30 million copies. The only book that I know of that has sold more is the Bible. The movie was made in 1939 with Clark Gable and Vivian Lee, considered one of the top 10 movies ever made. It won eight Academy Awards in 1939. It perpetuates many myths about the pre-war South and about reconstruction, particularly with respect to blacks. And I think that that's probably the biggest criticism of it is the way that she portrayed the blacks in the book and the way it was portrayed in the movie. I thought this you might be interested in this. Margaret Mitchell never wrote another book. Someone asked her sometime after 39, when was her next book coming out? And she said, are you kidding me? That book ruined my life and I'll never write another one. And she did not. She was killed in a traffic accident in 1947. The next book I wanted to uh, talk about is All Quiet on the Western Front. It was written by a man named Eric Mariah Remark in 1928. He was a German, obviously. It's about German soldiers who were initially high school students. Then they go to the Western Front and serve in the Western Front. And <clears throat> their patriotism is destroyed by what combat was really like on the front. And then when they came home, they realized they just did not belong back in civilian life. And the hero in the book, Carl Balmer, is killed on the last day of the First World War, a day at that time called In Dispatches. It was so quiet, it was called All Quiet on the Western Front. That's where the name came from. It sold two and a half million copies in 22 languages within 18 months of being printed. It was very popular in the 20s. It was made into a 1930 American film. It was an anti-war film. It won two Academy Awards and it is still highly regarded today. It was remade for television in 1979 and it wasn't nearly as good as the one that was made in 1930. Thought you might be interested in the next piece of information. I've read a number of Remarks books. He continued to write about Germany during the Weimar Republic. He even wrote books about the Second World War. Goebbels had his writings declared unpatriotic and banned them from Germany. Copies were removed from all libraries and restricted from being sold or published anywhere in the country. The next one is The Cruel Sea. Bill and I have talked a little bit about this. I don't know <clears throat> how many of you know about it. It talks about a lieutenant commander on a corvette, which is a small Navy warship, Royal Navy. The book is very, very uh, evocative. The ship is torpedoed by a U-boat. Many of the crewmen die. It just it portrays war as just one long period of border of boredom, coupled with moments of terror. The way it really is. It was written by a man named Nicholas Montserrat in 1951, and it was based on his experiences serving in corvettes and, and frigates in the North Atlantic during the Second World War. A historian still considers his fictionalization of his experiences as the best and most authentic guide to the mentality of a wartime escort commander. It was made into an excellent film in 1953, and I remember seeing it when I was a teenager, and it really, really impacted strongly. It did not make me want to go into the Navy, Bill. Montserrat wrote a number of other books. 
including The Ship That Died of Shame, which was also made into a film of the same name, but it got nowhere near the publicity that The Cruel Sea got. Montserrat died and wanted to be buried at sea, and so he was. The next book is something that I think is a very interesting book and a fascinating movie, Apocalypse Now. It's about an army officer serving in Vietnam who is tasked with assassinating a renegade special forces colonel. The colonel saw himself as God and was behaving it. It's somewhat of a parable of the Odyssey up a river with tribulation at every bend. The movie was made in 1979 by Francis Ford Coppola. It won two Academy Awards and many people think it should have won a lot more. People had trouble relating to it. If you look at the timing of it, it was apparently too close to the Vietnam War. And if I remember correctly, the Academy Award that year went to Kramer versus Kramer, which was a totally forgettable movie. Many of the scenes were surrealistic. The one that, that you might remember the most is when the colonel has the, the guy uh, surfboarding in the middle of, a, of a, an offensive coming ashore. But it communicated the reality of Vietnam better than any documentary that I ever saw. It's actually based on a book called The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. It's a short story but it's about a man on an upriver journey to find and destroy evil in the form of Kurtz. And apparently that's where Brando got his concept of portraying Kurtz the way he did. It is today considered one of the greatest films ever made. I didn't make that up. I actually found that in writing. Next book I wanted to talk about was something also I read as a young person, The Red Badge of Courage. It's about a young private in the Union Army. He flees from the field of battle. He is overcome with shame and longs for a wound, which he calls or is called a red badge of courage to counteract his cowardness. When the regiment once again faces the enemy, he's the standard bearer carrying the flag in the attack. It was written by a man named Stephen Crane in 1894. He was born six years after the Civil War, so he, ha he had no personal experience whatsoever with the Civil War. He served as a war correspondent during the Spanish-American War. It was made into a movie in 1951 starring Audie Murphy. And if you ever get a chance to see it and haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's an excellent movie. Murphy is much better in that than he was in most of his Westerns. What they think is, is that Crane listened to war stories in this town square of Port Jervis, New York, that were being told by members of the 124th New York Volunteers. That regiment had been at Chancellorsville, and it was believed by local historians to be the inspiration for the battle depicted in the Red Badge of Courage. I've always heard that the battle that they were talking about was Antietam, but if he had picked up most of his information about it from that group, I don't think they were at Antietam. He died from tuberculosis at the age of 28. Since its publication, and its publication was uh, 1894, that novel has never gone out of print. And it's in print today. If you want to buy a copy, you can buy it. It is a very easy book to read. It's a very, very evocative book also. It's very simple. Just tells the story of a young boy and how being in battle affected him. George, we read that in high school as a required right. reading in our 
English class. Yeah, that was just part of our English curriculum. Wow. It's a good book. A very good book. Same, same here, Bill. We read that book in high school, too. Did you really? The next one I was going to talk about is The Band of Brothers. Most of you are familiar with The Band of Brothers as a uh, miniseries, <clears throat> but I don't know how many of you realize the book was written by Stephen Ambrose in 1992. And the way he wrote it was he had a series of interviews with surviving members of Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. When he uh, initially wrote the book, it wasn't the, the success that it later became. Tells the story of, of Easy Company starting with their training in Georgia, through the drop into Normandy on D-Day, the drops in Market Garden, the Battle of Bastogne, all the way to the end of the war. It's an amazing 10 months of story. Ambrose himself was a history professor at the University of New Orleans. He wrote 27 historical works ranging from the Second World War. In particular, he liked Dwight Eisenhower. And again, if you want to read a very, very good biography of Eisenhower, Ambrose's biography of Eisenhower is excellent. He also wrote Undaunted Courage, the story of Lewis and Clark. I, I think of, of Ambrose as a popular historian. He wrote the kinds of books that uh, average people enjoy reading, not just writing for other historians. Now, according to our guide on the Band of Brothers tour, and, 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 and Bill, I hope you don't disremember this, the book was not particularly successful until HBO produced the miniseries in 2001. That miniseries is still the top rated miniseries of all time. And it is just outstanding. Interestingly, the hero, Colonel Winters, is portrayed by an Englishman. Ambrose died in 2002, so he's been dead almost 20 years, but his legacy is carried on by the Stephen Ambrose tour. They have tours of the Civil War sites, World War II sites, the American Revolution. They have tours of the Lewis and Clark expedition. They are really a very uh, excellent tour group. George, I, if, if George I, I remember that, uh, you know, we went on that Band of Brothers tour in Europe, and that was outstanding. I'd recommend it to anybody. But as you recall, he really, what did, didn't he really sort of stumble into a reunion of this right. easy company guys and begin to take notes? Uh, of That's how the book was formed. He came up on a reunion in a hotel in New Orleans where they were attending something next door and began to oh. interview those guys. He stumbled yeah, yeah. into it. You're right. You're, yeah. And and uh, Spielberg and Hanks got involved <clears throat> almost by accident too. It, it's an interesting story about how all that came about. Okay, the next book you've probably heard the title of. I don't know how many of you have read it called The American Caesar. It's written by a historian named William Manchester. He wrote it in 1978. Manchester was one of my favorite historians. Uh, a book that he wrote that I still have on my bookshelf is A World Lit Only by Fire, talking about the 14th century. But The American Caesar, was was the book that that got hit Manchester a lot of publicity. It's a biography of Douglas MacArthur. It covers his career that began with his graduation from the military academy in 1903. He was the number one in his class and ended with his dismissal by Truman in 1951. It paints a sympathetic but a balanced portrait of MacArthur. 
It praises him for his military genius and his administrative skills, but it criticizes his vanity, paranoia, and tendency towards insubordination. As the title suggests, his central thesis is that MacArthur was an analog of Julius Caesar, who, by the way, if you know Caesar's story, he was a general. He crossed the Rubicon, became <clears throat> one of the, the three, um, I forget what they call the lead senators, maybe somebody else would know. He was never Caesar of the Roman Republic. His uh, son became the first Caesar. Manchester was an American author, biographer, and historian. He wrote 18 books, which have been translated into more than 20 languages. He wrote a three-volume biography of Winston Churchill, which is also an excellent book, by the way. The American Caesar was made into a four-part documentary series in 1983. I don't remember seeing it, but I might have. The movie MacArthur did not rely that much on the book, if you remember the movie. Now, this is just another uh, small aside. I was present at the military academy when he gave his, when he, MacArthur, gave his famous duty, honor, country speech. Fred, you were gone by then, right? No, I was there. Oh, were you? Yeah, I think so. Anyway. I remember uh, it anyway. He was quite a speaker. The word oh, bullshitter comes to mind when I think about listening to him talk. He was, he and Winston Churchill, to my mind, are the two most prominent orators of the 20th century. The next book is a book called Andersonville. I don't know how many of you have read it or know about it. It was written as a novel by a man named McKinley Cantor in 1955. And I can remember reading it when I was very young. When I say young, teenager maybe. It's acclaimed as the greatest novel ever written about the Civil War. It was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. It captures the shame of America's conflict in that crowded world at Andersonville. And if you haven't ever gone to Andersonville, I really encourage you to do so. It's in the middle of nowhere in southwestern Georgia. At least when I went there, they did not do much more than put a, a, uh, a boundary line around where the camp was. It seems like it was about 25 acres, something like that. There was a creek that ran through it, and it was out in the open. The prisoners lived there for a year. Almost a third of those died there. It was uh, before 18, it was not built until 1864. Before 1864, most prisoners were actually exchanged. And when Grant became chief cook and bottle washer of the Union Army, he said, let's stop doing this because all we're doing is giving the South soldiers to put back into the Army. That's when they started putting a lot of people in prison. There were some prisons before that. Andersonville, I think, at its peak had something on the order of 30,000 men in the open in the south of Georgia for a year. It's an it's a interesting, kind of a sobering place to go visit. The book was based on prisoner memoirs, most notably something called Andersonville, a story of rebel military prisons. The main protagonist of the book is a man named Henry Burtz. Burtz wasn't even an American, I believe he was Swiss. He was a commandant of the prison. He had been wounded early in the war and he never fully recovered. He was, he was uh, invalided 
out of the active army and given command of this prison camp. He's not portrayed as an inhuman person, but as a sick man struggling with a job beyond his capacities. An excellent Broadway play, and if you haven't ever seen this, I really encourage you to, to find the TV production. In 1971, it was awarded three Emmys for the Outstanding Single Program and for Technical Direction and for his adaptation of the book. It is, it, it's the story of Wirtz's trial. He is the only person, the only person who was executed for war crimes from the Civil War. He was also honored with a Peabody Award, whatever that is. Next book is kind of personal. It's called Vietnam, A History. It was written by Stanley Carnot in 1983. It also was awarded the Pulitzer Prize the following year. It clarifies, analyzes, and demystifies the Vietnam War. It's pretty much free of ideological bias. It's very factual. It's very compassionate in terms of how it treats people. It doesn't spend a lot of time demonizing, neither does it spend a lot of time hero worshiping. It's filled with revelations that came from secret documents, interviews with participants, French American, you can read the list. It's a very, very readable history book. Among some others, which I'll include in the program, it gave me a better understanding of the Vietnam War after the fact. George, for some reason your George, for some reason your mic went mute. Yeah, we lost your sound, George. George, this this uh, Vietnam history, how how factual was this in your mind? How factual? It's, it is a very very factual rendition. I don't. Where did where did my when did I go mute? Well, it doesn't matter. Like I said, it was published <clears throat> as a companion to the 1983 PBS series. For those of you who remember it, I thought it was very, very good, that being the PBS series. It was also used in the Ken Burns special, but not as even-handedly. I thought Ken Burns' special had an ax to grind and I was not overly impressed with what he did. That's just my opinion. Next one I wanted to talk about was Black Hawk Down. George? Yes. Back to Vietnam for a second. Have you read the one by Max Hastings? No. I highly recommend that. Okay. Max I've read a lot about it, but I haven't read that one. It's really good. Okay. Black Hawk Down is the story of modern war. It was a book written in 1999 by a journalist named Mark Bowden. It's the story of the United Task Force efforts to capture a Somali leader in 1993 and the Battle of Nogadishu between US forces and Adid's militia. One of the key events in it is the downing of two US Black Hawk helicopters and the attempt to rescue their crews. That that U.S. group was actually a special operations force, Rangers, the Aviation Regiment, the 10th Mountain Division, Delta Force, and Navy SEALs 
And they also were UN forces involved, but those were mostly in the relief force. The people who went in the first time were the SOS troops. It was the most intense close combat for the US military between Vietnam and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was an intense 2001 war film produced and directed by Ridley Scott. I thought it was a very, very good movie. And it helped me understand how much of a mess we're dealing with in the Middle East and, and Northern Africa. Next book I was going to talk about is The Team of Rivals. It's a book that was written in 2005 by historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. It's excellent. It's a biographical portrait of Abraham Lincoln and some of the men who served with him in his cabinet, focusing really on his time as president. Three of his cabinet members had run against Lincoln in the 1860 election. His attorney general, the secretary of the treasury, and the secretary of state. And if you think about that, just in a little bit in, in the abstract, that takes a lot, lot of something, I'll just call it moxie, to put those people into your cabinet because they were his adversaries in his presidential campaign. It focuses on his attempts to reconcile conflicting personalities and political factions on the path to abolition and victory of the Civil War. The movie Lincoln is a 2012 biographical drama film directed by Spielberg and based on the book. It was nominated for 12 Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director, and it won two awards. Actually, the one that, that I remember it winning was Daniel Day-Lewis for, for his portrayal of Lincoln. Well, shoot, where am I? Okay, I thought I'd throw in something a little lighter. 1776 is a 1972 American musical drama film directed by Peter Hunt. The screenplay was based on a Broadway musical of the same name. 1776 is also a book written by David McCullough, published in 2005. It's a companion book to McCullough's biography of John Adams. It focuses on the one year, the first year in the start of the American Revolution. The book on Adams is actually much more comprehensive and, and to get the total picture, you need to read them both, but together they provide an excellent exposure to the revolution. It's about the leadership and indecisiveness of George Washington, and that's an interesting set of words. It doesn't portray George Washington as the father of the country figure that we see him now. In the beginning, he was not as nearly as uh, well focused and as well thought of as he is now. They also pay attention to King George III, William Howe, and Nathaniel Green. The books are just, the book 1776 really just talks about the Battle of Dorchester Heights, the Battle of Long Island where Washington was badly beaten, and the Battle of Trenton. It's focused on that single year of 1776, but you get a very good sense of what 1776 was like. George, if I could comment that I recently read that book, 1776. Okay. It, it was, I was shocked at how close we came not to getting any further than the first year. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it was very close. Uh, and you're right. Washington learned a lot of lessons in that first year. Yes, he did. The next book and movie some of you might know of. If you haven't seen it or read it, I really encourage you to do so. The Paths of Glory is a 1957 anti-war film directed by 
Stanley Kubrick. It's based on a novel by the same name by a man named Cobb. He served with the Canadian Army for three years during the First World War, and he fought in the Battle of Amiens. The book itself was written in 1935. I have never seen the book and I have not read it, but I have seen the movie more than once. It begins with a voiceover that describes what trench warfare was like in World War I up until 1960, 16. And as we have seen in the more recent films about the First World War, the picture that it paints is a very gruesome one. The movie stars Kirk Douglas, he's Colonel Dox, commanding officer of French soldiers who are given an order by, by a French general to uh, attack the German trenches, and they refuse to, to attack, so they mutiny. Dax then attempts to defend them against a charge of cowardice in a court-martial. They're found guilty and executed. And you see the whole thing. In 1992, the film was de deemed culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress. It's selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry. And I don't know what's in that film registry. It would be interesting to look that up. George? Yes. In that, did, didn't they, in the First World War, didn't they? Uh execute uh, chemical warfare oh yeah but these you know, guys were executed by their own troops why they didn't want to uh do a lot of uh charging i mean no no chemical. this was before but this was before that was this it was, if i recollect it took place in 1916 and i'm not sure when the first time was the germans used gas but it didn't have anything to do with it, it, the story was more about the stupidity of attacking over and over and over again. It portrays the general, the general who uh, sponsored the attack as being totally out of touch with reality. Yeah, George, it was based on an actual event in the French army. Yes, it was based on a mutiny in the French army. Next book is American Sniper. I suspect most of us have seen the movie, but it's a <clears throat> 2014 war drama film. I didn't remember that Clint Eastwood directed it. It's based on the memoir, <clears throat> American Sniper, the autobiography by Chris Kyle. So it's based on his own book. And if you look at the dates, 2012, and you look at 2014, and you remember the end of the movie, he died very quickly after he wrote the book. It follows the experiences of Kyle, the deadliest marksman in US history. He had four tours during the Iraq war, 160 of his kills were officially confirmed by the DOD. Even though Kyle was celebrated for his success, you could even tell from the movies that his tours of duty took a heavy toll on his personal and his family life. He was a tormented man. At the 87th Academy Awards, it received six nominations, including Best picture adapted screenplay and best actor but it only won one award and i'm not sure how they decide what awards are actually given out it was the highest grossing war film of all time now that is unadjusted for inflation there are others that if you take inflation into account gross more than american sniper but it was a very successful film the next one is Grant. There have been a number of books written about Grant, starting with his autobiography, which I have read. It was written as he was dying of throat cancer. It is reputed to be the best autobiography of the Civil War. And if you read it, he reads 
very, very easily. He's very matter of fact. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time on flowery words. He's, he's, uh, he was a good writer. And he wrote that as he was dying so that his family would not be destitute after his death. The most recent book on Grant is the biography Ulysses S. Grant, written by Ron Chernow. I've also read that, and it's very good too. As we all know who Grant was. And I say that with a tongue in cheek because when I grew up, I barely knew who he was because we paid a whole lot of attention to Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, and not a whole lot of attention to Lincoln and Grant and those people here in Chattanooga. Grant served two terms as president of the U.S. from 69 to 77. Thus far, history does not well regard him as a president, primarily because of, of the uh, chicanery that went on during his administration, which allegedly he had nothing to do with, but because he was president, he was responsible for it. Chernow asserts that his defeat of Lee and his presidency have been seen in an undeservedly negative light. He didn't just win the war because of superior resources. There was, a, there was a concept called the lost cause that was actually developed by several older Civil War, Southern Civil War gen generals. And in order to elevate Lee, they demonized Grant. Supposedly, that's where his reputation got. It's, it's a trash. A three-part miniseries began Monday. I have not seen it yet. Bill and I were talking. I have the first two sessions on, uh, on record. It's two hours at a time, but it's rebuilding his reputation as a great general. And if you read about Grant, if you read about the other things that he did during the war, you get an, a much, much more comprehensive picture. His capture of Vicksburg is absolutely incredible. He also did well here in Chattanooga that people don't want to think too much about. Third session is tonight at nine o'clock, PBS. Right. Past our bedtime, Bill. The next book and movie is called 12 O'Clock High. And I don't know how many of you have seen or read it. It was a World War II movie starring Gregory Peck. It was released in 1949. It was on, was it on the curriculum supporting film list when you were there, Fred? Yeah, it was. I thought it was an excellent movie. I really enjoyed it. In fact, I saw it. It was on every year, and I guess I saw it four times. It's about air crews in the U.S. 8th Air Force flying daylight bombing missions against Nazi Germany. And <clears throat> the more I read about the 8th Air Force and flying those daylight missions, the more incredible it was to be a crew member. Your life expectancy was well less than the 25 missions that it would take to be uh, to finish your tour of duty. It was a very, very dangerous force to be in. The squadron in, in the book has a morale problem. Peck is brought in to rebuild the morale and turn the uh, unit into a successful element of the war effort. He achieves the results, mostly through discipline, and he pays the price for it. He's not killed. He has a nervous breakdown at the end of the movie. It was adapted by these two gentlemen from a 1948 novel, 12 O'Clock High, that they wrote. Bartlett had been on the staff of the 8th Bomber Command as an intelligent assistant. And there he came into daily contact with this general right over here. He was a, he, Bartlett, was a close observer of the development of the 8th Air Force, and supposedly he used General Armstrong as his model for the role that Peck played. 
Armstrong became a lieutenant general after the war. Next book is Pork Chop Hill. The original book was a Korean War novel written by S.L.A. Marshall. If you know who he was, he was the historian of the, the time that wrote about Second World War and the Korean War. It's about a pair of, and I didn't remember this, <clears throat> a pair of infantry battles during April and July of 1953. <clears throat> now think about when that was. They had been negotiating the armistice agreement for years, and they were still out on Pork Chop Hill and other places fighting battles. In the United States, the battles were highly controversial because of soldiers killed for terrain of no strategic or tactical value. The Chinese lost more than the American soldiers. There were 2,000 American casualties on Pork Chop Hill, and many times that of Chinese casualties, and as the saying goes, for nothing. It was made into a movie in 1959. It starred Gregory Peck, and you've seen Peck's name in a number of things. The New York Times called it unforgettable. Now, the interesting thing about the movie, and I had not remembered this at all, even though the Army had fully integrated by 1953, the, the film portrays African-American soldiers when they were still racially segregated. They were poorly trained, poorly equipped, and poorly led. The next one is one of my favorites. You may or may not know of it. It's, the name of the book is Hell in a Very Small Place, The Siege of Dien Bien Phu. It was written by a French journalist named Bernard Fall in 1966. It's the first book that I read about Vietnam. And it made me wonder what was different about the war that I was experiencing from the one that the French experienced. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu had a great impact on the world after World War II. It marked the end of the French Empire and of Western colonialism. Although I'm not real sure what to call what we were doing in Vietnam if it isn't colonialism. It details in very, very carefully details the strategy of the generals, their assumption that Jap could not get artillery up on these hills around Dien Bien Phu, and then the day-by-day -day demise of the fort. It is an excellent book. Dien Bien Phu was written, <coughs> it became a film in 1992. It was a French film regarded by many as the more important war movies produced in French filmmaking history. And I'm not sure if that's an accolade or not. The movie was not a commercial success. I really encourage you to read this book if you have not. George, you did a great program on Dien Bien Phu back, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And for the newer guys, I would suggest you do that again for all of us. That was a great, and I read that book as a result of your suggestion, and you're right. A lot of us don't know much about the NBN food. So it was a great program. You might want to do it again. Okay, thank you, Bill. Did you hear that, Jerry? <laughs> the next one is about Lawrence of Arabia. I just recently finished a small, bi and I say small, this was not a very lengthy, biography on P.E. Lawrence. And I was really surprised at the scope of his activities, not to mention what happened to him after the war. He was so well known that he went into seclusion after the First World War, and his, the rest of his life was not one he'd want to live. I also tried to read Seven Pillars of Wisdom. That's the book that he wrote, his autobiography of his experiences during the revolt. I did that when I was a cadet, couldn't wade through it. Did you read it, Fred? Uh, no, I did not. That's too bad. It's symptomatic of us and our comprehension of unconventional warfare. It's just 
so complex in its in its thinking. Actually, it probably fit well with the American Revolution, but we don't remember that very well. Churchill said it ranks with the greatest books ever written in the English language. I, that's being seven pillars of wisdom. Since I haven't read it, I can't attest to its veracity. The movie with Peter O'Toole was distributed in 1962, widely considered one of the best war movies of all time. And here's the reason why, and I think this is a really good explanation. It has a hero who it doesn't worship, hero worship. It portrays a flawed warrior corrupted by pride, soured by his victories, and betrayed finally by his bloodthirstiness every time he killed someone. Lawrence was very clearly a conflicted man. Hey, George. Sir. Just a, just a little side note uh, with Peter O'Toole. When I was uh, working in New York, I was going to Baltimore on a on an Amtrak, and uh, I was sitting next to this man, and we had a nice talk, and he decided to get off in Philadelphia. I was going to Baltimore, and the conductor said, do you know who you were talking to? And I said, no. He said, you were talking to Peter O'Toole the whole time. Really? Yeah. So I was talking to him and didn't know who he was. <laughs> but I okay. knew the name Peter O'Toole, but I mean, it just didn't ring. I mean, we were just talking yeah. to each other and having a good time. Lawrence of Arabia, the authorized biography of T.E. Lawrence was published in 1990. At that time, it was selected as one of the six best nonfiction works of that year. I haven't read that either. Glory. Glory is a 1989 war film about the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. They were the second African-American regiment of the war. Stars Matthew Broderick as Colonel Robert Gould Shaw and Denzel Washington, Kerry Elvis, and Morgan Freeman. It depicts the soldiers of the 54th from the formation of their regiment to their final actions at the Second Battle of Fort Wagner. The screenplay <clears throat> was based on the book, Lay This Laurel, two books, and the other one, One Gallant Rush, Robert Gould Shaw and his Brave Black Regiment. I've not read either of those books. Glory was nominated for five Academy Awards and won three. Glory is, is still, I think, as good a Civil War movie as there is around. It ends with the tragic assault of Fort Wagner, but it had a strong message about the African-Americans who served in the Union Army. And then I put a little aside in here, and I was just reading the other day, the Confederate Army, two weeks before Lee was defeated, authorized the use of black troops in the Confederate Army. 12 strong, and it was originally published as a book named Horse Soldier by Doug Stanton in 2009. It tells the story of the special forces who were sent to Afghanistan immediately after the September 11th attacks. The movie was released in 2018 and it got mixed reviews. Some of them praised it and some of them criticized it for being too mechanistic. And it also demonstrated the lack of hindsight in the war in Afghanistan. I'll let you read the postscript. They, every one of them survived the mission. They captured their objective. The planners had thought it would take two years to do this and it took them three weeks. Al Qaeda considered this to be their worst defeat. I don't know where they talked to Al Qaeda. It creates an impression of Afghanistan that is very powerful. Put it mildly, it's a mess. Okay, I have a, a reading list for those of you who have an interest. If you want to read about the Civil War, the book I would read is The Battle Cry of Freedom by James McPherson. It's the best book on the Civil War that I've read. 
I also have the Civil War Trilogy by Shelby Foote. You all remember Foote from, from the TV show or the uh, mini series on the Civil War. If you're interested in World War I, I recommend The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman or Mein Kampf. And by the way, I have not actually read Mein Kampf. As far as World War II is concerned, I recommend Rick Atkinson's Liberation Trilogy, From the Army at Dawn to the End of the Second World War. Another book that I really enjoyed is called The Arms of Krupp. It's the story of the arms maker Krupp from their original inception, I think, in the 1600s. And I think Krupp is still around. I don't know that they make arms anymore. The third they one make them. They make a lot of elevators for us. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. The third one is the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shirer. And then the last one you might not have heard of. It's called Stillwell and the American Experience in China by Barbara Tuckman. It is outstanding to learn a lot about what was going on even now in China. This is an interesting book to read to, to get a better picture of China. Hey, George, Sir. George, in World War II, there was another book about, unforg was it Unforgiven? The guy who was captured by... Uh... Yeah, yeah. I, I saw the movie and read the book, and that that was very. I mean, what that guy went through was just living hell. Unbelievable. Absolutely right, Norm. Yeah, unbroken. 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 Yeah. The book to read about Korea is "The Coldest Winter" by David Halberstam. If you want to get a very, very good overall picture of Korea, that's the book to read. I've got three up here on Vietnam. First one is The Best and the Brightest, also by Halberstam. You can tell Halberstam is one of my favorite writers. A book called The Bright Shining Lie by Neil Sheehan. And then last is called The March of Folly. And what Tuckman does is she goes back in history and she looks at how countries or regimes over a long period of time have made terrible mistakes towards the end of their uh, power. And she uses Vietnam as the one of modern times to talk about. Hey, George. Sir. There was another book in World War II. I read it and saw the movie again. It, it um, it's, it's the guy who, uh, who broke the German code. Oh yeah. Uh, Turner Turning. Huh? Name was name was Turing. Yes. Turing, yeah. He eventually committed suicide because he was gay. Right. And it, it was illegal back uh, back in England. He was he was an English, but he basically uh, broke the uh, the Enigma code and uh, probably was the first guy to uh, really make a, a computer yes that's that's supposed to be true okay in conclusion i think that what we value and what we think is important is more strongly influenced by media expressions than we realize and we need to be conscious of their impact as we consider them think about what you're looking at think about what you're reading think about what you're doing because of how it actually in the long run influences the way you view the world. George, if I could add to that. Sure. Most of this media is, is presented to make money. You got to look at it from a view. They're, they're a money making machine. They're writing books and making movies to Absolutely. make money, sell a story and that. So you got to put a lot of perspective. Absolutely. You know, the major theme of most of these books and the movies is some variation of anti-war perspective. Interestingly, if you go back to all the books that, and, and things, but old men keep getting young men killed in war. And then my last conclusion was, even though these works influenced my perspective, I'm still fascinated by it. End of story.
Let me one hour. Hour. <laughs> Let me interject one thing. Uh, you mentioned uh, the trilogy on the Second World War by Rick Atkinson, which I think is fantastic. He has just started another trilogy with the first novel, is, the first book is out on the War of the Revolution. And uh, the first not the first one is called The British Are Coming by Rick Atkinson. It's a, it's a fantastic book, and he's got two more to go. But, right. uh, I, I like him. I like him very much. Yeah, good writer. Well, the the uh, just one little conclusion I have is just when you read all these books, it really is sad that we are really man's inhumanity to man is just appalling. And and it's been going on for thousands of years, and you keep on saying to yourself, "Will it ever stop?" I don't. I I don't. I I have little faith that it will ever stop. It, it it's really it's beyond me. I agree with you, Norm. I mean, just look at look at uh, the the All Quiet on the Western Front. How could you watch that movie? How could you read that book and then go out and start another war? Yeah, exactly. And it's and the, and the other thing is, is that generally speaking, wars are started by old men and getting young men killed. <laughs> does, it, does that mean we need to put women in charge, George? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> some of some of them think that they could do a better job. Some of them might be able to. Anybody got anything else? George, are you going to share maybe your suggested reading? Uh, several of those books I've read, couple, some of them I have not. Uh, is there a possibility you can send that out to, yes, I to can. us? Or, yes, I can. Huh? I'll be glad. Yeah, good. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Well, don't forget, this is recorded. I'll send a link for the recording out when when complete so you guys can watch it again before you fall asleep okay <laughs> <laughs> listen that was at very three o'clock in the morning when we 